Let's continue to sing and praise the Lord. I was buried beneath my shame. I was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you. I was breathing. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. It was my tomb. Till I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, to your glorious name. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, to your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your mercy has saved my soul. And now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. Out of the 
darkness to your glorious day. You call my name. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day
disasters that are happening across our continent, Lord, the fires, the hurricanes, Lord, the flooding. God, we pray that peace and hope and safety just be poured out by your Holy Spirit, Father. God, we know that you can work all situations for good, Lord. God, we lift up those who are there serving, those who have been affected, Father. God, especially Samaritan's Purse, Lord. God, we pray that through these tragedies, Lord, that more will be gathered into your kingdom, Father. God, we give you all glory, all honor, all praise belongs to you, Father. We worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite Preston up. He's one of our deacons. He's going to give us a quick update here on uh, some church finance stuff. Good morning. Last night I couldn't remember all the deacons' names, and you know, I can't remember my children's names either, so I don't feel bad about it. But my wife said, "Well, why don't you write them down?" So, so I did. Uh, I'm one of your deacons, and uh, Christy is one of your deacons. I don't know how many of these folks are here. Uh, Lisa, Chris, Leanne, my wife Denise, Gary, Tom. Scott, Stan, and Pastor Steve sits in as an advisory, non-voting member of the deacon board. Anyway, so we get together, and uh, we have responsibilities to the church for uh, budgeting and watching finances and things. So we are at the point of the year where we're starting to talk about budgets for next year. So we thought we would come to the congregation and just let you know where we're at and uh, where our needs are so that we can kind of plan for next year's budget. Uh, our budgets start with the calendar year in January and run uh, through the end of December. Uh, so we do have some needs. Uh, one of the things that, that we find is when we have our, our projects, which are great things, like the carpet project, is that the congregation is so faithful that we put a call out, we have a figure, and we say, we need this amount of money to do this project. The congregation jumps up, and boom, within a couple of weeks, we have the money to do the project. It's exactly what happened to the carpet. Uh, I don't miss the red carpet at all. Uh, and the carpet looks great. <laughs> but what, one of the side effects is that when that happens, and we have these projects. Tithing for general things in the operation of the church have a tendency to go down. So what we're here this morning to talk about just briefly is what the, the financial status of the, the rest of the church funds are. So this is the chart that you see up there uh, is the difference between what we budgeted for this year, January through August, uh, versus where we actually are. And if you, our budget indicated that we would be $12,000 uh, in, the, in the black with net income, when in fact we're actually $21,000 in the red. So that's a, a swing of about $33,000 there. So we're about $33,000 uh, below where we want it to be. Uh, and that may sound like a lot of money. I, I know that would be a lot of money out of my, my pocket, but, you know, when we spread these things over everybody that comes to church, really it's, a, it's an amazing thing how, uh, how rapidly we can uh, replenish uh, those funds. So that next slide, Peter. So this is 
the combined ministries. This includes all the ministries together, uh, Mount Zion House, uh, the church operations, which we just looked at a minute ago, uh, oh gosh, the food pantry, uh, the school, missions, everything together. Uh, this isn't really significantly different number. This, the swing on this is about $38,000. So the rest of the ministries actually are doing fairly well, and probably they will actually see some improvement over the next couple of months and, and break even. So our biggest concern is this church operations part of the budget, because that's the budget where uh, the operations take place. It's the part of the budget that pays for the lights, and it, it pays for the gas, but it also pays for the employees and the employees' benefits and all the things that goes along with that. Uh, so we're going to try and get that replenished over the next couple of months. Uh, if we don't, then we have to make some plans for what we're going to do next year. And the lights and the gas and things are pretty fixed, fixed things, and it's pretty difficult to save any money there. Uh, you can only turn off so many lights to save a couple of, of cents here and there. But overall, those, those expenses stay about the same. So what happens is then we, we look at personnel. So where can you save money with personnel? Historically, where we save money with personnel is we just don't pay our senior pastors as much as they're supposed to be paid. So uh, his, in the past, that's where the hit's taken. Now, biblically, we are supposed to take care of our pastors, and we promise them that, well, we're going to pay you this much. So we really probably should actually do that. So what, what we're letting you know is that we have this need. We want to maybe handle it like we do all our other projects, that, that if uh, you talk to God about it and you feel the desire to help make up that difference and uh, just put in a little bit extra so that we can make it up, That'll make our planning easier for our budget for next year, uh, which we will approve the budget hopefully in November. So we have about six to eight weeks here to try and try and make this up. Uh, God is faithful. And, you know, we put our faith in God. He always comes through somehow. Mount Zion will still be here. Our pastors will still be here. And, and somehow, you know, we will make this work. But it would be much better if we could just make up this difference or, or the majority of that difference so that we can take care of our pastors in the way uh, that we are supposed to take care of them. So we just wanted to let you know uh, where we're at. We don't usually come to you before the end of the year, usually we, we wait till the end of the year and we say, well, this is how we, this is how we turned out. <laughs> uh, and, but we thought you should know where we're at and, uh, and let's just see you know, how we do. Talk to God about it and see where we should, we should go with it. So thank you. And Father God, we just give you all the praise and glory, Lord. And uh, we just thank you, Lord. And you've always been faithful to us, Lord. And, uh, we just put this into your hands, Lord. Uh, we pray all this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Preston. Thank you for the deacons and everything they do to keep this place running. Amen. So, all right, if you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. Part of uh, are in the backs of the seats in front of you. There's a connection card there. If you fill that out, if it's your first time here uh, for a Sunday morning after the service, go right over here out these doors and you will find the Welcome Center. And we have a gift we'd like to give you. We'd like to get to know you some. But in that gift is uh, something making me hungry right now. It's part of a free breakfast at Grandma Vicky's in Lake Geneva. And I love breakfast, so praise the Lord. So if it's your first time here, Get in on that, okay? We're glad that you're here. We want to welcome you. Right after the service today, there's a ministry mall down in the gym after this service, all right? Here's what the ministry mall is about. 
Uh, it has some of the ministries here at Mount Zion, but I, have, I always have people coming to me telling me about their ministries and, and asking if we can help and how they could get in here so that our people can know about them. And so what we've done is invited these ministries to come in. They've set up tables and they have information down in the gym. So right after this service, if you would go down there, you can see those ministries, talk to different people, find out what's going on in our county and the surrounding areas. And then God can move on your heart if you want to get involved, if you want to help support them. But that's what's going on with the ministry mall down there, okay? And I believe we've even moved uh, refreshments down there to draw you. So just so you know, that's why they're down in the fellowship hall, all right? There's a baptism class here in the sanctuary right after this service uh, today because uh, the 17th next week we're going to have a beach baptism. I would appreciate it if you'd pray for a little bit warmer weather uh, next Sunday, but I know the water's pretty warm, so we're going to have a beach baptism and a picnic down there. Uh, if your last name is between, starts between A and M, bring a side dish. Between N and Z, bring a dessert. We're going to provide hot dogs, buns, and uh, water for down there, okay? Uh, Sunday school fall launch uh, begins also next Sunday. Uh, there's a poster out in back, Foundations for Believers, okay? Check your bulletin for all the other information, or please ask us if you have questions. We're going to Go into the uh, series we're in right now, Fruit or Fraud? Is there fruit in your life? I want to ask you a question today. How's your faith? How's your faith? If you were in a hurricane or if there was an earthquake, you know, there was an earthquake in Mexico. I hope you guys watch the news a little bit for this stuff. I think they're birth pains. The beginning of the end. And so how is your faith? How's it holding up, you see? And for some reason, the Lord told me to tell this story when I start, so I will. I was milking, getting ready to milk cows. You know, you're just getting ready to throw the, the switch on the milking machine, and uh, the whole neighborhood knew when we started milking because we took all the mufflers off everything when I was young. And so you'd throw the switch, and they would start bellering. And I was just getting ready to do that, and, and, and one of my old neighbors who was out plowing came driving in with his tractor and his plow. And he said, Dave, I need you to weld something for me. And I said, well, what happened, John? And he said, here's the thing. He said, I was coming right up next to the fence. And he said, all of a sudden, I looked to my right, and I saw all the fence posts moving. And, and I said, uh, what happened, John? He says, well, I hooked the fence down on that end. And he said, uh, I, I drugged that fence and tore it down pretty much. And, and he said, um, it broke the gauge wheel off my plow, and I want to finish plowing the field. He said, could you weld it? And I said, yeah, I'll do my best, you see. And so we took his, the gauge wheel off, and I took it in, and I welded it all back together. And then, you know what this feeling is? After you weld something, you go, I wonder if that will hold. <laughs> and the, the interesting thing is he plowed the rest of that field, and his gauge wheel was still on, and I was like, oh, God, thank you. You know, it worked. But how's your faith? What's your life like? Do you really bear fruit for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? When things get tough, does it hold? So this morning we are going to read 1 Kings chapter 13. We were there a few weeks ago. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Turn to your neighbor and say, he talks fast, he'll be done in time. Go ahead. We'll make it. And whenever you say you're going to read the whole chapter, people go, oh, oh my gosh. They, you know, will we make it for the Packer game? You'll be there in plenty of time. No problem. All right, chapter 13 of 1 Kings. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar. This is what... Uh, what the Lord says, a son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! 
But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Their father asked them, which way did he go? And his son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, saddle a donkey for me. And when he had saddled a donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. And the man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me, by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. And as he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was left lying on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Some people who passed by saw the body lying there with the lion standing beside the body and they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey heard of this, he said, it is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him as the word of the Lord had warned him. The prophet said to his son, saddle the donkey for me, and they did so. And then he went out, found the body lying on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The lion had neither eaten the body nor mauled the donkey. So the prophet picked up the body of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back to his own city to mourn for him and bury him. Then he laid his body in his own tomb and they mourned over him and said, Alas, my brother. After burying him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the message he declared by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. Father, we ask that you give us knowledge and wisdom today. That, Lord, you would make our lives fruitful 
And that, Lord, none of us would be called frauds in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're following in your outline, prophet from Judah, fruit. The prophet that came from Judah, what was his fruit? The first one was he spoke prophetic truth to Jeroboam. He said to Jeroboam, there's going to be another king come. His name will be Josiah. And he's going to burn the bones of these false priests who, who offered sacrifices to false gods. He says he's going to burn them on this altar. He says this altar is going to split in half. It did split in half. And so the words that he spoke literally came true. And that's fruit from his life. He heard from God. He spoke the word to the king. Folks, I hope you know that's like going to the president and telling him you're doing things wrong. That was not an easy task. He had courage. He went and he spoke the word of God. Next, he healed Jeroboam's hand through intercession. We've talked about this before a couple weeks ago, but, but you know, the king, he, he said, seize him. He was mad at, at the prophet. And it says his hand shriveled up and he couldn't even pull his hand back. And then the king has the audacity to say to that old prophet from Judah, hey, intercede for me so my hand will be restored. What would you have done if you were the old prophet? I might have said, let me think about that. But isn't it interesting how that prophet prayed for him immediately and his hand, it says, was restored. That's fruit from his life. Do you realize God was after Jeroboam's heart? See, God was after this guy. Even if, as evil as he was and all of the bad things he did, he was giving him a chance. The next part in fruit is he resisted Jeroboam's invitation. Jeroboam said, you come back with me, I'll give you a gift, I'll feed you. And, and he resisted and he said, no, God told me that I'm not to eat or drink in this place. I would also have to tell you that Bethel has become such an evil place because of what Jeroboam did, but if you, if you backtrack to the days of Jacob, this place was called the gate of heaven. Remember? Jacob stayed there and he said, I didn't realize that I'm at the gate of heaven. And he saw a ladder extending with angels going up and down, reaching to heaven. And that's how evil it's become here. So in the fruit part of the, the prophet from Judah, he resisted Jeroboam's invitation. He invited him to the White House to eat, was going to give him a gift, and he said, no. God told me don't come there. Don't eat here. Go back by a different route. So he did that. All right? So that's the fruit in that prophet's life. Here's that prophet from Judah's fault. It's in your outline. He defied God's word, he disobeyed his command, and he suffered death away from home. These are the words of that old prophet that deceived him and brought him back. And he said, you have defied the word of God and you have disobeyed his command. And that was the fault in this man. This is where he strayed from the word of God. We talked about this, I think it's two or three weeks ago when I read this text, and I said partial, partial obedience doesn't make it. <laughs> so many of us, uh, we, we pick the Bible out and we say, well, I like that part, I'll follow that part, but this part, no, that couldn't be what God meant. Yes, it is what God meant. We can't pick and choose, so it was partial obedience. So his fault was that he defied God's word, he disobeyed his command, and he suffered death away from home. Now let's turn to the old prophet from Bethel, his fruit. The fruit is he, he spoke God's word to the prophet of Judah concerning his death and burial. He's the one who came to him, and, you know, when they were eating, and he said, oh, he had revelation from God. And he said, you've defied the word of God. You disobeyed his command. Now you won't be buried with your ancestors. In other words, you're not going to get home to Judah. And that came true immediately when he saddled his donkey and he began to head home. He was met by the lion. 
So that was fruit. The next thing is he buried the prophet from Judah. He didn't just say, well, too bad for you, man. He literally went and got him. I have to mention to you, he went and picked up the body and the lion was there. Did anybody catch that in the story? Did you know he didn't drive up in an F-150 with the door closed and the windows rolled up and grabbed the body? He saddled his donkey. There was no protection. He had to go there and pick that body up with the lion there. I don't know about you guys, but I would think for a moment, what will that lion do to me? But to his credit and to his fruit, he went and he picked up the body of the prophet from Judah, and he took him and he buried him in his own tomb. It's amazing when you think about this and you look at it, see. The next thing on the area of fruit is he instructed his sons to bury him with that prophet from Judah. He buried him in his own tomb, and then he said, hey, when I die, put my bones next to this man's bones. This is fruit in his life. Now, the prophet from Bethel's fault. He lied to the prophet from Judah, resulting in the prophet from Judah's death. It says it right in the text, right there. It says, he says, an angel of the Lord told me that you should come back with me and eat. But then it says, he lied to him. I can hear the junior high discussion now. You see, they lied in the Bible. It's okay to lie about my homework, isn't it? We hear it all the time, don't we? But it's wrong to lie. That was a fault. He shouldn't have done that. Now let me take this one step further. We talked about this when you're hearing the voice of God. Somebody comes and says, an angel of the Lord told me this, all right? What you need to say is good. Thanks for delivering the message. Now I'm going to talk to God about this and decide if I need to do what you're saying. And the point is this. I would not trust that guy. Would you trust him? If you watched this whole scenario and he came to you and said, hey, the Lord told me, I would go, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll talk to the Lord about that, but I don't think I'm going to do just what you said right now, okay? I'll give it some thought and I'll go to God. Amen. Be very careful about who you trust and what you do and when you act. See, if you go to God and he, he confirms it in certain ways, then okay. But don't just walk into things, okay? So we've looked at the two prophets. We're talking about fruit. We're talking about fraud. Who's real? Who's not? What are they bearing in their life? Can we talk about the peculiar lion? Did anybody think here when you were reading this, that's an interesting lion? I mean, he kills the guy. He, he doesn't eat the body. It says it in there. He didn't eat the body. And then he stood there with the donkey and didn't touch the donkey. Did anybody think that's a little peculiar? It's a little bit different. All right. Now turn to somebody and say, this is Pastor Dave's opinion. Go ahead. Don't, don't go saying this is, you know, this is it, Okay. When I get to heaven, God might say, it, it was just a lion and he did what I told him to do. All right, that, that's, that's what he might tell me, like Balaam's donkey. But this is what I think. I think this lion represents the lion of Judah. I think he represents Jesus because Jesus has the power to take a life, doesn't he? And this lion took that old prophet's life, but then he did not eat that body. He didn't defy it or defile it. He waited and he guarded it, literally, until the man came and picked it up and buried it. Folks, we're all heading that way, aren't we? There's a day coming, and God knows when that day is. It says our life is in his hands. And I believe that this represents the, definitely the power that God has. But when I read it, I started thinking, that lion is so peculiar, Lord. And it reminds me of the lion of the tribe of Judah, you see who holds my life in his hands. Listen to what it says in Isaiah, because this is a piece of heaven, I think, here on earth. Isaiah eleven six 6 
through uh, 7 or 8 I'm going to read. And it's also in Isaiah 65. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. The enmity is going to be gone in heaven, folks. You're not going to be afraid. You can go up and pet a lion. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? Nice kitty. And here it is happening in the Old Testament in this story. Because God brought it to pass. Now, before we go to the next point, I have a question for you. And I believe, see, the Holy Spirit wants to test your hearts when you're discerning fruit or fraud. When you meet somebody, remember last week we talked in Matthew 7 where it says you will know them by their fruit. And you put people in a category when you meet them, don't you? You look at them and go, oh, you got to be kidding me. Or, hey, I want to know that guy. And then you find out later, maybe you didn't want to know that person. So what do you think the buzz around Bethel was around town when all of this went on? What do you think they were talking about in the churches? They were going, yeah, yeah, I knew it. That prophet that come from Judah, yeah, he might have done something good there at the altar and God worked with him, but he messed up, he disobeyed, and that's what you get for that. What do you think the word was out on the street there? It was like, yeah. Yeah, we knew it. We knew there was something wrong with him. Remember the old church lady, right? Uh Uh-huh. Sure. Sure, we know what's going on. Then the guy that went and picked him up. You see? The old prophet from Bethel. And they were going, well, we thought he was bad, you know? We thought, sure, the lion would eat him when he went to get the body. It didn't happen. Oh, maybe he's all right. Can you hear all this? All the things going on. And people are yakking, oh, look at this, look at this. We're all making judgments, aren't we? What's it like in church when somebody falls or messes up, you see? Do we show grace or mercy or do we just immediately, uh, condemnation? Do we even give God time to work? I can't tell you how many times I sit and God says, just wait. The phrase he uses with me is, let's see where he lands. (laughs) In other words, how do I know? There can be repentance, right? There can be repentance and great glory can come to God when something changes, when a family's restored. You see how that happens? And he says, you just have to wait. You have to be patient. You don't always know how the story ends, folks. Which brings me to the next point. Are you ready? Now, now, get the story straight. You got the two prophets, right? They both messed up, didn't they? They both did some really good things. They both did something wrong. What's the end of the matter here? Look at your point. Fruit 300 years later. Fruit 300 years later. You remember what the man prophesied? to the altar, to Jeroboam. He said, there's a king coming. His name's going to be Josiah. So we're going to 2 Kings now, chapter 23, 2 Kings, chapter 23, and verses 16 uh, through 20, all right? Then Josiah, this is 300 years later, he looked around, and when he saw the tombs that were on the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it. Isn't that what the prophet said? In accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by the man of God who foretold these things. That's the prophet from Judah. The king asked, what is that tombstone I see? The people of the city said, it marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things you have done to it. 
Leave it alone, the king said. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria or from Bethel. That's the old prophet from Bethel. Just as he had done at Bethel, Josiah removed all the shrines at the high places that the kings of Israel had built in the towns of Samaria and that had aroused the Lord's anger. Josiah slaughtered all the priests of the high places on the altars and burned their human bones on them, and then he went back to Jerusalem. Isn't that exactly what that prophet said was going to happen? And church, we have to wait 300 years In the midst of that story, you're wondering, what is wrong with these guys? Why are they doing that? What's going on? But now stop and ask yourself, how did Josiah feel when he said, what's that tombstone right there? And they said, that is the tomb of the prophet who 300 years ago prophesied that you were going to do exactly what you're doing today. And it had to confirm Josiah in his heart. Anybody ever listen to Paul Harvey? And that is the rest of the story. What's the application for us this morning? First and foremost, do not judge others too quickly. You see, church, we have to judge. We could judge those two prophets when they were there. The one prophet lied, that was wrong. We can say it's wrong. We can say that was the wrong thing to do. I'm not going to trust you right now, but don't throw him out. Everybody tracking with me here? The other prophet who spoke amazing words to the king, and they all happened, but then he messed up. He defied the word of the Lord, and he disobeyed the command. And you could stop and say, oh, he's a bad guy, you know, just stay away from him. But how about let's see where it landed 300 years later, they confirm what Josiah was doing by being buried in that tomb. And King Josiah said, don't touch it, leave it right there. It's a testimony to what God was doing and to the standard that God raised up there in Israel. Be careful, folks. You don't always have to judge You know, you don't always have to throw that person out. You have to judge what they're doing. It's wrong. This is wrong right here. But it doesn't end the life. Did anybody notice that? It doesn't kick them out of the kingdom of God right away. There's repentance. There's forgiveness. Give them a chance the way God gives you a chance. Amen? Very important. Here's the other thing. Strive to bear fruit that glorifies God. There are so many times I see people, they give up. They say, oh, I messed up my life. It's over. It's done. No, it's not. God can use you right where you're at. He's building your testimony. He's moving you through this. And it's time for the church to wake up and say, I don't care where you're at now. I, I can see what got you here. But God can work. He can bear fruit through this. The Spirit of God can rise up. There can be repentance. There can be forgiveness. There can be reconciliation. And it's my prayer this morning as we go through this, you know, is it fruit? Is it fraud? Next week we're going to be in a story in the Word of God where where everybody thought that this person was the last person on the face of the earth they wanted to be with or talk to, and he winds up being one of the fathers of our faith. And so as the body of Christ, I'm here this morning to say, will you take heart and start looking at the character of God? I also want you to know that there's no one on the face of this earth, there's no one in this church that's perfect. That's why they say if you find the perfect church, don't join it. But have the character of God. Have the grace of God. Look at this story, how both of these men did some really great things, 
both of them totally messed up. But then 300 years later, God uses it to confirm what Josiah was doing. Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, our lives, we may have everything all together this morning or there may be lives in here that are just shambles this morning. And Father, I pray for your true character to come through. For those who are in the depths of despair, that they would realize, Lord Jesus, that there's still hope. That, Lord, you can put that family back together. You can fix that marriage. You can can restore the things that have been lost. Your word is all about restoration and reconciliation. At the same time, Lord, help us to be able to judge according to your word and to use your word as a standard because sometimes we just have to say what you're doing is wrong. It's not right. But Father, keep a balance in the body of Christ so that we can leave room for redemption and so that there can be reconciliation. Lord, if there's one in here today that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray you won't let them leave without confessing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Lord, if there's any in here whose faith is faltering, Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen our faith because, Lord, in these last days, we are going to have to cling to you. Lord, you are proving to us over and over that we're not in control. You are. Father, again, be with those in Florida going through this storm right now. Lord, draw them to put their faith in you. And, Lord, let the rest of the world understand what's going on here. It's written down in your word. Don't let them bury their head in the sand and say it's global warming and it's this and that. Let them look and say, I think God has something to say here. Father, strengthen our faith today so that it holds during the storm in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you need prayer, we're here. We want to pray for you. Uh, If you have questions, we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, if you need to, to go, please go down through the fellowship hall and look at the ministry mall down there. We're actually done early, so you have time to do that, okay? God bless you.